Welcome to On Par with the President. On this episode, we are honored to host Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, the United States Ambassador to the United Nations. Well, we're going to tee off with a couple of questions. Ambassador, you grew up in Baker, Louisiana. Did you have a vision or plan to take you from Louisiana to the world stage in foreign, foreign service? Uh, that's an, a, a great question. You know, four, four miles down the road from, uh, from LSU. And no, I did not have a vision or a plan. I, I was writing something about myself uh, recently, and I wrote without thinking that I didn't even know when I was growing up what ambition was. Uh, so I certainly didn't have a plan, but my thought was I wanted to do something. I wanted to be some somebody. I wasn't even sure what uh, I wanted uh, to be. So I started thinking about wanting to be what I saw. So I knew teachers and I thought about being a teacher and one of my teachers had a husband for a lawyer. So I thought maybe I wanted to be a lawyer, but I didn't know about wanting to be an ambassador or to be a diplomat. It just wasn't on my radar until I was much, uh, much older. So what sparked your interest in a career in foreign service and public service? How, how did it all unfold for you? Yeah, I, you know, I graduated from LSU in 1974, and I went to University of Wisconsin uh, to get a master's degree in public administration with the intention of coming back to Louisiana to go to LSU's law school. And But when I was in Wisconsin, I just became enamored with one of my professors, uh, Crawford Young, who has since passed away, who uh, did African uh, studies. And I became interested in Africa and stayed on in the PhD program to get a PhD in uh, African politics. I will admit that I never finished uh, the PhD, so I always told Crawford I was a failed student of his, but he really whetted my appetite. I went to Liberia uh, to do research and stayed in Liberia for about a year, a uh, little bit over. And uh, from that moment on, everything changed for me. I met people who were in uh, the Foreign Service in the State Department, uh, including my husband, who was at the embassy uh, in Liberia, and the rest is history. That's amazing. Tell us a bit about your childhood and your experiences at LSU. So I uh, went to a segregated school uh, in uh, Louisiana, Baker High School, just down the road from where I live was a white school. Uh, it integrated in uh, 1968, uh, but most of us had been in our, our school, which was about 10 or 15 miles down, down the road in Zachary. Uh, so I went to a school, Northwestern High School, it was all black. Uh, we had amazing uh, teachers. It was a small school that went from first through 12th grade. Uh, I'm still very close with classmates that I graduated with. But when we were graduating and thinking about going to college, I decided I wanted to do something different from everyone else. So I decided to go to LSU. And so in summer of 1970, I arrived on uh, LSU's campus and spent four very uh, complicated, I think is the way I'll describe it now, very complicated uh, years. It was not for me, uh, I have to say, uh, a period of, uh, of, of fun and happiness. Uh, LSU was a different campus uh, back in the, in the 1970s. Uh, so I was just happy that I graduated because I saw so many of my black colleagues who didn't graduate uh, because it was not a warm and welcoming environment uh, for people of color. So how did you survive? What, what made it possible for you to negotiate all of that? You know, I always tell people that uh, I have had a life filled with adversity uh, from growing up poor with uneducated parents uh, to going to segregated schools. And I, as I look back on my life, I feel like my adversity muscles were constantly being developed. 
So if you look at my personal uh, Twitter account, I got an uh, arm up uh, like this because that's my adversity muscle. Uh, so the harder it got for me, the more determined uh, I, uh, I became. And so I was determined that I was not going to uh, allow the environment on the campus to uh, force me to fail. Uh, so I was going to succeed no matter what. Uh, and after a very, very difficult first uh, semester when I was put on academic probation, uh, I kind of uh, pulled up my bootstraps and worked a, a, a bit harder. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it wasn't easy, but the day I graduated was an extraordinary uh, day for me. Thank you for sharing that. Today at LSU, we're focused on something we call the Scholarship First Agenda through uh, five areas. We call them our Pentagon to protect the people of the state of Louisiana. It's agriculture, the biomedical sciences, coastal science and engineering, defense, including cyber, and the energy sector. And obviously, ag and energy are our two largest industries here. And we seek to solve local problems, both in the Gulf region, Louisiana, and or in the world around us. So today, help us understand, what do you think the value and importance of higher education is as, as you circle the globe in the work that you do? You know, uh, President Tate, we, we live in a global world, and what we do locally impact us globally. So you're uh, sharing that with me, reminded me when I uh, was ambassador to Liberia, LSU had a program in Liberia working on an agricultural program, working on rice development. My research at uh, the University of Wisconsin was on rice and politics in Liberia. Uh, but to see LSU there when I uh, went as ambassador really let me know the broad connections that, uh, that we have and the importance of people connecting. So. LSU is a, it's a global center. It's not just dealing with uh, issues that are important to you. Everything you mentioned, I'm dealing with in the Security Council right now. It's the environment, uh, it is energy, it is food insecurity around the world uh, because of the war in Ukraine. I just came back from Ukraine last week where they are the breadbasket of almost the entire global uh, South, Africa and the Middle East depend on so much of their grain. Uh, Louisiana is, is, is part of that, that chain of food, and food security. Uh, you provide rice to Haiti. Uh, so we're dealing with the situation in Haiti and I learned from uh, Senator Cassidy that companies from Louisiana are exporting rice to Haiti. And because of the gang violence and the blocking of the port, some of our businesses in Louisiana are being impacted. So you really are a part of, of uh, the global environment. And I think your students will play a key role in how we address these issues in the future. I always say to young people that we, my generation blew it on the environment. And now we have presented the next generation uh, with a crisis that they have to deal with today. You're educating your, your young people to deal with these crises. Well, Ambassador, I'm gonna say this to you. Um, I need to get you on campus to tell that exact story because the Pentagon um, is so important for what we're trying to do here as a research institution, and you just articulated the global perspective. I appreciate that very much. Now, we talked a little bit about golf, and this is sort of a golf show, and you teed up really well. You got the ball out into the fairway, but the big thing is you know, you've got to get to the green. you got to get to the green because you want to score. So share a little bit about how did your journey in public service you know, lead to you becoming an ambassador. And tell us a little bit about your, your life in teaching in higher ed, political science, 
both are really related, I think. You know, being an ambassador is sort of teaching and learning, and obviously you engaged in, you know, teaching political science. Help us understand the journey. I'm not a golfer, and I, I don't understand golf, even though I'm trying. Uh, but I, I think it, it's relevant here because it's about setting goals. So you know what your goal is. Uh, and you, you set that goal and you work really hard. And sometimes you get waylaid. Uh, so you're going to hit a ball into, I, I've heard my husband, you hit a ball into uh, the sand. Right. And so you, that, you have to be more determined uh, to get out of that, to get to the goal that you're trying to uh, achieve. And so that's how I have uh, approached my life. Uh, I'm focused on the goal. I know that there will be challenges. There will be, uh, you know, I'll be misdirected at some point, but just keep your eye on, on the fairway. I guess that's what I, I would say. And that's how I ended up uh, getting to this point because I wasn't working to become the ambassador to the United Nations. I didn't work to become the ambassador to Liberia or the assistant secretary for Africa. What I worked to become was successful. And uh, when you achieve success, success will be presented to you in, in certain ways that you never ever expected. Uh, and then you mentioned teaching. I taught at Bucknell University uh, before joining uh, the Foreign Service. And there I, I found that sometimes my students were smarter than me. Uh, and that you have to, when you're teaching, you are teaching, but you're also learning. And, and in diplomacy, I always feel like I'm learning because in order to be successful in diplomacy, you have to be able not just to communicate uh, by talking to people verbally, you have to listen. And so when I was teaching, I spent a lot of time listening, uh, particularly when I was teaching at the graduate level uh, at uh, Georgetown, where I would spend the first section of my class with my class telling me what they knew about the subject that they learned over the weekend. It was a course on negotiating uh, in conflict on South Sudan and South Sudan was making news all weekend long. I didn't have time sometimes to pay attention. So I gave them the first 15 to uh, 30 minutes of the class to tell me what they knew that I didn't know. And then we take that into the discussion uh, in, the, uh, in the classroom. Uh, so again, your eye on the goal, but also you have to always uh, be prepared to uh, let others lead uh, by learning from them. So in your role in foreign service and as an ambassador, what would you say your biggest challenge you faced from external forces or in the situation or context that you could share with us? You know, I, I think the biggest challenge uh, is right now. Uh, we are dealing uh, with a situation where the world is questioning whether democracy is the way they should be going. And we know that democracies work because we've seen democracy work in our own country. But we also know that democracy is not easy. It's a process. And sometimes you're taking uh, two steps backward uh, instead of uh, a step forward. And you just have to, again, as I talk about dealing with adversity, you just have to keep learning from that experience and building on the experience. Countries are saying to us, who are you to tell us about democracy? You had a, 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 an attack on your capital that we saw across the world and you're telling us about democracy? Why should we trust you? So that is huge for me. Uh, but I think our country is an example of democracy at its best but also an example of how to deal with challenges to democracy, because there will always be challenges and you have to be prepared all, all the time to face those challenges. 
heavy lift. I, I have to ask this. How, how do you handle the weight of the job? I mean, it's a weighty job, you know, maintaining international peace and security. How, how do you handle that? You know, I, um, uh, I always look for uh, those things that help me relax. I'm a walker. I'm a serious walker. Uh, I say that somewhat uh, with tongue in cheek because I'm not as serious as I used to be. I, I used to do uh, between an 11 and a half and 12 minute mile walking. I just, and people say, when you're walking, are you thinking? And I'm like, no, I wipe out thinking. Uh, when I'm walking. The only thing I'm thinking about is taking that next step in, in front of me. And it cl- cleanses your, your brains when you allow yourself to do that. So that's one way I address this. And the other is cooking. So I am serious about cooking. Uh, I like my own food. Uh, some people cook and they don't like to eat their own food. I like to eat my own food and I like to serve it to to people. So I came back from a real weighty trip last week. I went to um, uh, Albania and then went to Ukraine and spent 12 hours on the ground in Ukraine, nonstop, 12 hours meeting with the president, meeting with uh, people who were impacted by the war, seeing the situation on the ground, having a 10-year-old girl say, please end this war. What can you do to end the war for me? I want to go back to school. I want to see my friends. So it is weighty. Uh, and, and I return back on Thursday morning. Um, I normally live in New York. My husband is here in, in the Washington area in Virginia. And I just walked in the door and started cooking. Uh, he has a little garden and it's growing butternut squash. And there were like 12 giant butternut squash sitting on the kitchen counter. I'm like, what do you do with these things? And I figured out what to do with them. And I did two different recipes for butternut squash soup. I brought some into the office today. And people will say to me, you never rest. Well, that's resting for me. It, it, it's relaxing for me to sit and chop onions and stir pans and create something that is, uh, is amazing. I'm speechless, um, but I, I really appreciate what you do and how you balance that. That's quite powerful. And I hope our students understand you have to work at the nexus of the serious, but also do things to help you be able to manage that day to day. Well, Ambassador Greenfield, um, I greatly appreciate the time you spent with us. And thank you for all that you do um, for this country and for the, for the world. And I appreciate you taking time to be with us. Well, thank you very much for having me. I look forward to being on campus uh, again soon. Uh, And I want to congratulate you two for being where you are. I can't imagine what it would have been like for me at LSU uh, in the 1970s if you had been uh, president of the university then. It it would have been a game changer. Thank you for that. And Again, thank you for your service, and we look forward to welcoming you back as soon as you have an opportunity to come to Baton Rouge in your hometown of Baker. Thank you.